What is up, everybody? Uh, it is 9.43 p.m. here, uh, Monday night in Korea. And uh, I was just doing some streaming earlier today. I've been loving uh, streaming for you guys. If you haven't seen it already, go to Tasteless TV uh, under Twitch, and we can hang out there. Uh, it's been an absolute blast. I took a quick shower, uh, came out, and now I'm doing this recording. Um, so this episode is with James Chen. Now, I've been following this guy's career for a long time. You know, I've, I'm sure as many of you guys know, uh, I've been working in esports for, I think, almost 15 years now. And so there were not many people doing this in the early days. And so uh, James Chen was one of them. Um, and I've always really had a lot of respect for this guy. Uh, he's an FGC legend, um, amazing commentator. He also uh, did commentary for the Tetris World Finals. Uh, I know a lot of people saw that. You might not have realized that was also... Uh, James Chen doing that. That was actually one of the most watched uh, esports events that you can you can find uh, on the internet. It was a very cool tournament. If you haven't seen the Tetris World Championships, definitely check it out. This is also the last recording I did uh, at Evo in Tokyo. This is all before coronavirus. I have another recording we've already finished that we're going to be putting out in a week or two here. We will be debuting episodes after this one on Twitch uh, on Fridays. It's going to be a little bit tricky to set up, but once we have that all ready to go, um, all of the rest of the episodes will be after the pandemic went global. Uh, I really thought that each of these episodes would be pretty timeless, um, but of course we couldn't anticipate this world-changing uh, pandemic coming here. So sorry we weren't able to talk about that. Again, this was basically recorded right when it started to grow in China. Um also, I want to give a shout out to everybody that worked at Evo and the FGC in general. Uh, this is the first event I went to uh, where I wasn't commentating, um, but I was just trying to grab people and do interviews. They are really helpful, uh, getting me all these great interviews. And thank God they did because it's become much harder to get interviews. Uh, nobody's traveling anywhere now. Um, and so I'm really glad I had these ones stocked up that I could give you guys. I think you're going to enjoy this one a lot. And uh, before we start... Uh, Again, like I always say, patreon.com forward slash tasteless podcast. If you're listening to this and you've been meaning to donate, um, it, it really would be appreciated. Uh, it, again, we're going to a, a higher level of production, which means um, it's going to cost more. And so any support you can give is appreciated. Uh, now that we have you know video and everything else, it just costs a little bit more. And if you don't have the money, of course, it's no problem at all. Uh, and without further ado, I give you this episode with James Chen. All right, thank you for doing this. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man. <laughs> so you've been um, you've been full time now uh, for is it three years? Is that uh, correct? About three, three to four years now. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and 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 how much are you on the road then for that? Uh, you know, uh, it depends on the time of the year, obviously, because there's like busy season and there's slow season and stuff like that. But actually, these days, with as many fighting game events as there've been, like January is supposed to be kind of like a slow period, but I mean. Here we're in Japan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right now, so I mean, I would probably say on average, I travel maybe about like twice a month or something like that. So, what is that like? Because in my experience, with first of all, it's cool that you get to see the world. Yes, right. Especially yeah. when you consider that a lot of people would view what we do as like antisocial, or you know. <laughs> um, but the, the reality is, when you when you work at a job like this, you actually get to see the world. Yeah. Um, but is, is that is that tiring being on airplanes that much and hotels that much? Uh, I mean, honestly, the part that hurts the most is I'm away from my cats. <laughs> oh, no, lot, How many know, cats do you have? I just two cats. Two, two cats. cats. Okay. Yeah, I love Me my too. cats. They're, yeah. they're they're adorable. But you know, uh, that's that's the toughest part right now. But I mean, uh, to be honest with you, right now at this point, it's weird. I've gotten. It's almost kind of like, uh, like you're almost getting kind of. Uh, desensitized to traveling after a while sometimes i even forget where i'm at you know yeah. i don't know because i just end up going around all over the place and, and it's wild and and honestly like if you had ever told me that i would end up like in spain or kuwait because of video games i would have laughed at you you know yeah. 10 years ago and it's 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 really amazing and you know regardless of what happens with me with commentary or or whatever you know having been able to do that and see i mean the one thing that i always say is that geeks and nerds 
all over the world are all the same. <laughs> it, it's fantastic. I love that part. You know, like when we go to Kuwait, they love cosplaying as much as anybody. In fact, they're, when they do cosplay contests, they have performances and stuff like yeah. that. They put a, it's really great to see that kind of thing. And no matter, you know, how, how whatever I end up doing in the next five years or whatever like that, this chunk of my life feels like it's just been absolutely worth it. You know, I, I've got, we're in Japan. Like I said, I have never managed to come to Japan until the first Evo Japan and you know is this your sorry this is your second time here this is my third, third time, time here, here. yes okay. but every single time is for Evo Japan yeah and I've never I had never been to Japan before then and so you know now because of video games because of fighting games I've been here three times and you know every time I'm out here in Japan I have such a great time and all this like as much as traveling can be tiring and everything but you know at the same time to be able to do it Especially, you know, at the age that I'm at right now, because a lot of people don't get a chance to do this until, you know, retired or whatever like right. that. So I do feel very, very blessed to be able to travel and see all these different places and meet all these different people, see these different communities. It's just... Like I said, it's 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 great to see that the passion for video games, for geek culture, for that kind of stuff really is a universal thing, you know, that no matter where you go, you think that, you know, people are different. But really, the more you travel, the more you see that people are the same. You know, uh, one of my favorite stories recently, you know, in the Tekken scene with with uh, Pakistan kind of going crazy. crazy. Yeah. Uh, knee just went there to practice before the uh, Tekken World Tournament. And when he showed up, he had like a hero's welcome at the airport. Like there was all these fans in the airport to welcome knee in Pakistan. Like how weird of a sentence is that? And to me, that's fantastic. You know, that kind of thing shows how universal and, you know, how wonderful gaming can really bring everybody together. I'm I'm sure you've experienced that a bunch of times. Oh, absolutely. No, it's it's crazy. Like the, the, the countries I've been able to go to mm -hmm. and just seen kind of this thing that brings everybody together, you know, that yeah. there's there's nerds everywhere. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it doesn't matter what language we speak. The fact that we can come together mm -hmm, and compete mm -hmm. and, and share the same passion is so cool. Um, it's also crazy because... You know the world's getting more and more connected. I mean, this yeah. Pakistan situation is a perfect example. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I don't think anybody knew that there was a major scene uh, <laughs> for Tekken in Pakistan. Yeah. Um, not just that there's a major scene, but that they are actually like some of the world's best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that they're actually better than a lot of the other uh -huh. places in the world. And I think we're going to see more and more of that um, as the world continues to open up. Yeah. Um, I think actually, and I know that some people, I mean shit on cell phone games but the truth is with cell phone <laughs> games coming out i think it's just going to get more and more wired together yeah yeah so how do you deal with jet lag traveling that much because oh, i found for me that is the hardest thing is trying to be on camera you're trying to shout you're trying to entertain mm -hmm, you're trying to mm -hmm, analyze mm -hmm. but it's actually 4 a.m where your body clock is set <laughs> you know red bull <laughs> no, yeah. no i mean honestly uh one of the things for example flying here uh, just this, uh, just a couple of days ago, I didn't sleep on the plane at all. I forced oh. myself to stay up, and then by the time I got to the hotel, I had been up for like 24 hours, and so I was like, okay, I can pass out at night now. But I mean, honestly, traveling west, like going from California, Los Angeles to Japan, is always easier for some reason than traveling east. Like, yeah, I've experienced that too, actually. I, I, don't, I, I don't know what it is. Like last year, after I came back from Evo Japan, my sleep schedule was decimated i could not like my sleep schedule is so messed up so hopefully when i get back this time i mean melatonin you know yeah that, that makes a big <laughs> sleep difference pills kind of thing like that hopefully uh you know to be trying to fix it quicker this yeah. time but i mean honestly the the, the jet lag stuff is kind of tricky, but again, weirdly enough, even when I'm back in Los Angeles and my sleep schedule is normal, like I'm yeah. going to bed at like 5 a.m. anyway yeah. and waking up at like 1 and stuff. <laughs> it's uh, my sleep schedule so mess. I don't even have a normal sleep schedule, so you know. How many how many uh, hours are you casting a day when you're down at an event like this? Uh, it really depends on the event, yeah. actually. Um, 
Uh, most of the time, if it's like a Capcom Pro Tour event, uh, the nice thing about it is uh, Tenno, the guys who usually ha have been doing it the past few years, um, you know, they'll have like four commentators and they'll cycle us with two hour blocks and everything like that. So usually, you know, at most, if it's like some crazy kind of event going on, I'll do like maybe eight <laughs> hours a day, but usually it's around six to four a day in two hour chunks. Yeah. So, which is actually... I mean, when me and David first started doing this, uh, I still remember Capcom 25th anniversary tournament, which was before, you know, the, the first Capcom Cup. Uh, we were the only commentators for that event. It was for Street Fighter 4, Street Fighter Cross Tekken, and uh, Super Turbo. And we cast like over 12 hours. Like we just cast like 12 oh, st hours straight. And it was the, one of the most painful. <laughs> yeah, I've, 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 I've done that personally. <laughs> uh, this is back when uh, MLG was hosting a lot of StarCast. Yeah. But there's something uniquely painful about <laughs> trying to be on uh -huh. when you've already been on air for like yeah. that. And you're trying to shout and you're trying Have to... Uh, can I ask you this yeah. question? Have you almost ever fell asleep on a stream on a, on a, on a broadcast? I, I have I have been with somebody. I'm not going to say names, but I've been with somebody who started to pass out and <laughs> yeah, I had to like yeah, hit yeah. him. Uh -huh, it was uh -huh. not artosis before people asked. Okay. <laughs> um, but uh, I find if I've been talking for that long, I start to slur my speech. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. I almost sound like I'm drunk or, yeah. or something. Like I, my mouth gets tired, <clears throat> and then I'll just start to space out. Yeah. Uh huh. Like, uh -huh. My my coast will say something. I didn't listen to them at all. Right. Uh -huh. And I'll see them looking at me, waiting for me to answer. And <laughs> I have no idea what I'm, yeah. and then I'll end up saying what they just said anyway. So that's what I, happens to me. Like, honestly, uh, I almost fell out of my chair one time and one of the guy, the guy streaming looked at me who was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was so tired. Oh man. But yeah. Dude, how do you, um, how do you prep for commentary or, or, or is there a lot of prep? Because you've been, in the FGC for so long, right. your Twitter profile says you're an FGC historian, which yeah. I like that. Um, do do you need to sit down and do research before you cast, or are you just able to show up because you've known these players for so uh, long? A, a, it depends on the game. Like if it's Street Fighter, yeah. uh, you know, my prep work usually just happens when I try to play as much as possible, you right. know, because you just play and you get a feel for the characters and everything and you get hit by certain things and you know what the opponents are trying to do. So that's mostly where it comes from. But from like the history standpoint, it's, it's also hard too because, you know, fighting game tournaments have... You know, like Smash Ultimate here this weekend has like 3,000 competitors, right? Yeah. So it's like there's no way to research all of them, right? right. So you kind of just jump on and hope for the better, right. you know? And if you see certain people that you do know, and that's one of the things that I, I try my best to do is I try to remember all like the really interesting, funny things or or specific things that have happened to certain players, you know? Because to me, you know... Uh, I, th I feel like the players are the most important thing. You know, in the end, I it's weird for me to say this, but I feel like the game almost kind of doesn't matter as much as the players do. And that was emphasized the most when Dragon Ball Fighters came out, and it was all about Goichi versus Sonic Fox, right? Goichi is an anime game player, plays a little Street Fighter. Sonic Fox is the greatest NRS player of yeah. all time. They gain this rivalry in a, in a tertiary game in Dragon Ball Fighters, and no matter what, every time they played against each other, you had to watch. It didn't matter if you liked the game or not; you just had to see who was going to beat each other. And they just had this great story. I mean, uh, Sonic Fox won the first Evo, and then Goichi won the second one against each other. And you know, it just shows that you know. Let's say a completely brand, well, let's say like the Riot fighting game comes out here, right? The Riot fighting game comes out. If it's like Daigo and Justin Wong get into the game right. and then they end up playing each other, like that's like, oh my gosh, they played each other way back then and here they are again. And like, that's the important part. You know, yeah. the Daigo Justin history is the important part more so than whatever it is that they're playing, you know? And so for me, when I commentate, I I try as best as I can to you know humanize, make the players as as human as possible because that's what creates fans. That creates people who you know. Whenever you want to root for someone, you you're just that much more invested. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. I gotta ask this now since you just mentioned the Riot game. Uh -huh, uh -huh. What is your what is your take on Riot in general, and and what are your thoughts for them? 
making a fighting game. And let me just preface that with Riot is, out of all the companies, mm-hmm, the one mm-hmm. that um, exhibits the most control over their games. Yes. Yeah, they yeah, seem yeah. to have uh-huh. really succeeded in pushing League of Legends mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, as a successful sport. That game right. is actually older than StarCraft Two, even, and it's huge. Okay. Um, all right. What is it going to be like when they show up into the fighting game community? It's such an interesting situation. So, I mean, obviously with Riot, you know, I've always been, you know, jealous almost kind of the fact that, you know, you have this situation where Riot can just be like, oh, you know what, let's push these events as much as possible and everything. Fighting game community is in this weird position that we support so many different games from different companies. So we can't have Capcom be like the big guns because then they can be like no mortal combat this event right. you know as a fighting game community we don't want that we pride ourselves in having everything in there and so what's going to be interesting uh with riot is you know they have had the control like i know the commentators used to not be allowed to stream other games you know or, or other mobas and stuff like that yeah, I, yeah. I heard that's changed now right I, yeah there was some story that broke I, if i remember right like they yeah, I think they were not allowed. But I think they were streaming Hearthstone was the game oh, because okay, they're waiting. Okay. It takes a while to queue up at high ranks. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so there was this, I think, kind of crisis uh-huh, at, at Riot where uh-huh. even if even if the game said they were playing League of Legends, they would there be was, they would be Hearthstone <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> right, <laughs> so it was this yeah, great yeah. advertisement for Blizzard. Right. Um, I think they've eased up though. Yeah, it, but yeah. I'm, I'm I've heard about sure. that. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that. Yeah, but I mean, before like commentators, they couldn't commentate other games. The players, you know, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But what's fascinating about this whole entire thing is that the people who are working on the Riot game are uh, the rate. The, the company used to be called Radiant, right? It's uh, run by Tom and Tony Cannon. They're the guys who created Evo, right? Like yeah. they're literally the guys who made Evo. They're literally the guys who made, you know, who who basically kept the FGC alive for this long chunk of time. And so it's weird if Riot actually was like, oh well, f- this fighting game can't be with everything else. It's weird because they run Evo. So yeah, I, I feel like there's an. I mean, again, I don't want to like put any pressure on Tom and Tony Cannon or or like right. accidentally <laughs> say anything. So again, this is all me. Like no, there's I don't have any insight but you know it'd be interesting like i i'm hoping that you know from their standpoint they can explain why the fgc is a is such a different beast yeah than a, than a lot of the other you know games out there and a lot of the other esports out there and you know if we can get a situation where riot fighting game can just be another game at these events and everything like that i think that would be fantastic you know uh again i like the fact that the fgc is very diverse with the different kind of genres of games and everything. And even right now we're seeing this kind of shift where, you know, Tekken 7 is really kind of climbing to the top. And a lot of people would probably say it's probably surpassed Street Fighter Five in it, popularity. It seems like it's, right a, it's bigger now. Yeah. So, you know, that's... That's kind of what I like about the FGC is that it's a very organic thing that, you know, we play. And even at some tournaments, like I was just at a tournament in Chicago, Frosty Faustings last weekend, and I'm commentating Super Turbo, which is like a game that's older than some of the players. Yeah, in the, in the, you know? it's an old game. Yeah, and, yeah. and so we still support old game. We play whatever we want to have fun, you know? There was a a fighting game on the Super Nintendo based on the Sailor Moon property, Sailor Moon S, that's just had this random resurgence all of a sudden. It's like one of the most busted games ever, but for some (laughs) reason, everyone just started playing it again. And now it's at like a bunch of events and people are playing it, so. It's an interesting point that you make about fighting games. I guess they all rely on each other in, in a weird way. Um, because if you look at like Dota and League uh-huh. of Legends, like those are two completely yep. different groups of people. Mm-hmm. They don't play each other's games. Yep. Um, you don't have the, one event that has both of them. You yeah, know? there's no uh-huh. tournament where there would. There's, there's, I think there's literally never been a tournament right. where there's Dota and, and League. At even same, even like at a DreamHack or something like that. I think I don't. Okay, okay. okay. someone can fact check me on this. Um, but no, I, because I think. But DreamHack is like everything, right? So yeah, you know. but I believe that they get told oh really from what i understand yeah because they don't want an advertisement for another uh, game okay, they, they, okay. I mean, they're, they're the two big mobas right right um but yeah i think they've actually set it up in such a way that that's not the case okay okay because i know esl does dota i know I've, there was a period where riot was hands off yeah, more hands yeah, off, yeah, and, yeah. and as mm-hmm. times pass they've exerted more and more control and they mm-hmm, basically mm-hmm. run everything now so right 
But I, yeah, I think at the time there was never okay. a, a time where they were there together. But with fighting games, it's it's kind of the opposite. Is that is that because they're often played on consoles, and and so the setup can be different, or that the publishers are, are more laid back? Is there a, a reason for that? It's 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 really all from the arcade culture. Mm. One one of the interesting things about the fighting game community is even though we're not playing in arcades anymore, the established people who kept the tournaments running and everything like that and just the personality the attitude the mentality has always been very arcade based right the reason why we have these open tournaments where anyone can play is because that's how it was in the arcade you put up a quarter you played right we might not like you we may not know who you are but if you put up the quarter you were allowed to play we tried to beat you as badly as you could to scare you away from all the arcade and stuff like that. But there were times you would see this. I mean, it happened to me. Like I would go to an arcade. Nobody knew who I was. Everyone didn't like me, but then I proved that I was strong enough to go toe to toe with the strongest of players. And then I became friends with them. You know, it's like there's that concept that anybody can rise to the top. Now, at the arcades, usually you go there and like, for example, when we used to play Capcom versus SNK2 at Southern Hills Golf Land, yeah. Alex Vai, one of the greatest players of uh, all time, fighting game players of all time, he would run the CVS2 cabinet, right? So he'd just be on there. And there's just the one CVS2 cabinet there. And there's like 15, 20 quarters on there and everyone's trying to beat him and no one can beat him. But whenever you lost... You had to wait a long time for yeah. you to get, <laughs> and yeah. so people would just go and play the other fighting games. You know, yeah. like you would just go play the other machines and everything like that. And so that kind of mentality of you know you play all the games. You know, like it's, the fighting games is just something that you do. You know, that it doesn't matter which one you kind of play. And it's different now because there's definitely a lot more players who are very specialized. Like you look at someone like Tokido, he used to go to Evo and walk away with like seven medals hanging around mm-hmm. his chest. Now he only plays Street Fighter Five. Yep. That's a sign of how strong the competition is now. But then there are still players like a Goichi, like like a Kazunoko who play like everything and still and and so that kind of idea that all the fighting games live within one kind of umbrella, I feel like has been maintained well through through the genera even through this generational change, you know, and it's just uh, I don't know. Maybe it'll stop at some point, but as long as you know, like old guys like me and stuff yeah, yeah. are still around, you know, hopefully we can. I, I've always said it. You know, like I feel like a rising tide raises all boats, right? So right. no matter, you know, like Street Fighter. If you don't like Street Fighter, but then they kind of popularize the world tour concept that all the fighting games are doing and stuff like that. You know, like by supporting all the fighting games i just feel like we we all benefit from it but you know like i said i've always been kind of a love all fighting games kind of yeah, guy yeah. So. I, i've wondered um and i don't know if this is because all these uh fighting game tournaments have all these different uh games that are made by different companies but mm-hmm. and, and maybe this is just a japanese thing i don't know but um companies collaborating like putting akuma oh. in tekken <laughs> like yeah that something like that would never happen Right. And, and, and a lot of these uh, mm-hmm. competitive mm-hmm. PC games is how what I don't know if you have an answer for this, but what, why is that? How is that happening? How is that I, possible? I don't know. Yeah. I, it's weird. I mean, I know, for example, Harada and Ono are friends, right? Yeah. I mean, you, Harada like teases Ono all the time and they've done like little videos with each other and stuff like that. So maybe they were just like, hey, you know, I mean, obviously Capcom made Street Fighter cross Tekken. And so, you know, Tekken was probably like, oh, we'll test things out by throwing Akuma here because they were supposed to make a Tekken cross Street Fighter, which never happened. And so, yeah. uh, you know, they probably just was like working on tech, uh, on Akuma and like, let's put him here and everything. But I mean, that's not even the extent of it, right? Like there was this random, uh, not random, I don't want to call it random because I don't want to, you know, disparage the scene or anything. But, you know, there was a, a, a very indie kind of fighting game called Fighting EX Layer, which was based off of the Street Fighter EX series and stuff. You know, but Terry Bogard was in there from the King of Fighters games, you know. And yeah, there's like crossovers all over the place. And I don't know... Why? I don't know. Like, yeah, it's, it's I, so I different yeah, than anything. Uh-huh. And I guess even with, I mean, you know, Nintendo with Smash, of course, and them just kind oh, of yeah. go- gobbling up other uh-huh. uh, franchises, then putting them there. But this seems to be a huge trend that's in Japan, and it's not seen anywhere else. Yeah, and I don't know. Maybe they're super good friends in Japan. <laughs> I'm not sure yeah. how it happens, but I like it. I, I like seeing that kind of thing yeah. because it does create this little 
friendly kind of vibe going on. I mean, uh, how Omaru from Samurai Showdown is supposed to show up in Soul Calibur Six pretty soon, you know? And it's like, to me, I think that's cool because honestly, you know, uh, it's smart business. I also think from everybody, right? Because if I'm a Street Fighter player and I want to go and learn Tekken Seven, I can start by playing Akuma, and honestly. The way they translated Akuma to Tekken, he doesn't even play like half the Tekken characters. He breaks all the Tekken rules. Like Tekken, you don't have to low block as much. You stand block more because low moves don't do as much damage. But Akuma is like completely different. Like yeah. he can kill you off of a low if he's close enough to you and stuff like that. You know, but it's still a good way to bring people in. You know what I mean? So it it seems like it kind of makes sense and and and. And I don't know, like, I guess the fighting game companies don't really see each other as, like, huge, threats, like, competition. Really? I don't yeah. know. That's a great it's, question, it's just to be honest because, with you. Yeah. Like, um, and Blizzard, I mean, I've worked, I, I don't work at Blizzard, but I've worked with them for mm -hmm, stuff. And, mm -hmm. and they're pretty cool. But even at times when I'm doing stuff they view as really important, uh, I have been asked to not mention other games. Oh, so, yeah, like, when yeah, I, did, yeah. uh, I did Heroes of the Storm... Um, which that league unfortunately is not around anymore. Yeah. But, uh, that was really sad uh, when that happened. But um, <laughs> I did this thing on ESPN, and it was like I couldn't call them ultras or ultimates, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. which is what the the super move is in League of Legends. We couldn't call it a MOBA. Oh, yeah. Really? I, I had to like tailor the whole cast. Interesting. Because they didn't want to be and the game was what they call it a hero brawler, which is like I don't know what the fuck that right. is, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> that that's what they wanted me to right, call it, yeah, and, and yeah. I guess, and maybe there's legal reasons. I don't. I'm, I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm but not sure. Yeah, they didn't want any of the jargon. Yeah, we couldn't call the. Um, we can't call them champions. We had to call them heroes. Okay, okay. And because the champions is a League right, of Legends thing. Yeah. So, um, I'm just fascinated that's by this much collaboration. I don't know. It, it, it was yeah. funny because when we first started doing the Capcom Pro Tour. You know, we were actually kind of told that we can't really name a lot of the other fighting games and stuff like that. I don't even. I mean, this I might be feel NDA. like any time. I feel like I feel like I'm breaking NDAs or something like that. But no, I, but, I mean, I, I I kind of understand, but right. at the same time, I'm like, but is this really a threat? But see, here's you know? the interesting yeah. thing: was that you know, even though they said that, like, I know, like, both me and David and a lot of the other commentators, like, we kind of obeyed that at first, but then we just stopped caring kind of in a weird way and i would just be yeah. like yeah you know what uh you know itazan is really good at virtual fighter we would like before it was like he's really good at other fighting yeah. games now <laughs> we're just like he's really good at virtual F and like I, I you know i don't know if it's just because we stopped caring or something like that but you know it's just gotten to that point i know some leagues have stronger rules about yeah. what you can or can't say but i know on like when i'm on when i'm doing commentary for like Capcom Pro Tour, I'll just talk about everything as if it's just one, you know, one scene and it's yeah. just universal knowledge now. Speaking of that, are there rules about cursing? Uh, are, are, are... At Evo, we are, we're not allowed to curse. You're not allowed, right? okay, yeah, okay. at Evo, we're not allowed to swear. Now on the Capcom Pro Tour stuff, you know, uh, the guys who are running it have literally told me like, you are allowed to swear, but a lot of us you're won't. Not, yeah, or you're not encouraged to swear. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. We try our best to to keep it a little bit, but I mean, like, you know, yipes. One of his, uh, you know, classic terms is "bus ass," right? Yeah. You know, yeah. and you know they won't ding us for saying stuff like that. You know, we can say things like that. And yeah. I've I've said like, you know, like he looks like a whack ass something or other. You know, we've yeah. said stuff like that before on commentary, and they won't ding us for that kind of thing but you know just in general we still want to be a little more you know yeah we actually like when i do gsl there's no there is no regulations like, so like <laughs> I, me and dan for a while we experimented with cursing oh yeah kind of just oh, to okay, see okay. and we, we, we ease away i mean if we really think it's going to help emphasize something uh -huh. but you mm -hmm. know whenever we do it, people would think oh my god they're gonna get in trouble or we can actually say anything but right yeah i just feel like it doesn't sound as good i was just curious because I've, I've seen cursing um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm not clutching my pearls over it. I don't care. I'm just, I'm just always curious. As, right. as a commentator, when I see it, like, yeah. is there something happening? Is there ever a, a discussion about this? Right. So. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's never really been any direct implicit, except, like I said, at Evo, yeah. we can't swear uh, for Evo. But, you know, for a lot of other things, uh, there hasn't really been any sort of, like, implicit, like, you can't curse. Except, like I said, there's certain certain world tours that, yeah, you're, you're not allowed to, to swear and stuff. But for the Capcom Pro Tour, they've never really forced us into that. Yeah. So, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. What was it like casting Tetris? 
because <laughs> I I watched that and. I don't think I brought this up, at least in this podcast. I'm, I'm actually a big fan of Tetris. Oh, yeah? Okay, I feel like okay, it's okay. like the purest yeah, yeah, yeah. game. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, I, I, yeah, t- t- can you tell me a little I'm, bit about right the there. So, weirdly enough, as much as I do all this fighting game stuff, Tetris is my favorite video game of all time. Oh, really? Okay. I'm always, I have Tetris shoes on right now. These oh. are Tetris <laughs> shoes right here. So, like, I love Tetris to death. I've, it's always been my favorite game. And just like you, I, I think it's like the most pure video game yeah. ever made, right? Because you sit anyone down, don't tell them anything, and they drop a piece on top of the other one. They kind of know they did something wrong. Like, you don't right. even have to teach somebody. And, 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 uh, so it was interesting because they just put out a call on Facebook one time as the classic Tetris group. They're like, eh, we're just kind of auditioning new uh, commentators or whatever. And I didn't even see it. Uh, yeah. A friend of mine who knew I loved Tetris, I was like, you should apply to this. Yeah. right?" And I was like, OK. So I tried applying to it. And they're like, you're that fighting game guy, right? Do you yeah. know anything about Tetris? And I was like, I love Tetris. Yeah. And uh, they actually got me to, to, to try it out. I auditioned and they were like, you know Tetris. <laughs> and so uh, I did this little exhibition match. And then they were like, do you want to come and do like the actual championships? And I was like, yes. <laughs> it was so crazy when I saw Tetris there. Because I always, uh-huh. it's like, I think everybody knew. Yeah. That, that there's there's so much potential mm-hmm, with this mm-hmm. game. But, um, you know, StarCraft is... I think a, a consumable game, yes. even if you don't play. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I would say fighting games are more consumable if you don't mm-hmm. play because it, um, it's life bars. You know? it's, yeah, it's life bars. It's <laughs> Someone's two, it's trying two to avatars. hit the other guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but Tetris is just—it's just there. It's yeah. just—it's—it's it's so easy to show somebody what's happening and. and, 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 and I don't think there's a human on the planet that hasn't tried playing Tetris yeah, at one yeah. point. And so when you see the players playing and they're playing at the speeds that they do, yeah. it's like you're automatically impressed. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. See, so this is this is something that I've always, you know, when I talk about fighting games, esports kind of things like that, you know, one of the interesting, one of the most viral videos was the Daigo Perry video, right? But like if no one told you anything about it, you would just be like, whatever. But the yeah. fact that the crowd went crazy kind of gave you an indication that something amazing happened, right? That's the hardest thing I've always felt about esports is that we're trying to convince everybody that the things that people do are skillful, right? Right, right. Because, you know, if you are not even, uh, uh, I call them A sports, athletic sports, yeah, just yeah. as a joke, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, even if you're not a fan of, uh, you know, actual sports and stuff like that, physical sports, you know, if you turn on to ESPN and you see a highlight of LeBron James dunking on somebody, you're like, I don't know anything about basketball, but you just assume that it's amazing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so the hardest thing about fighting games, you know, there's reputations that it's button mashy or, you know, or if yeah. you're watching like a MOBA or StarCraft. Oh, like, yeah. It's fascinating it's, what people assume yeah. is not happening. <laughs> right. And, 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 yeah. and, you know, if you show an amazing play, sometimes people don't understand why it's amazing. Right. But in Tetris, because everybody's tried playing Tetris. When you see someone doing stuff and you your brain can't process where the pieces are going, yeah. like you already are just like, I can't believe these guys are this fast. Like, I, yeah. like you don't have to have played it expertly to know that they're being amazing at Tetris. And that's why, to me, Tetris is like one of the most like pure video games and why it has this weird appeal Does for somebody people. Own, is there one company that just owns Tetris? Yeah, it's the Tetris company right now. Is, so. it, is, is, is it the Tetris company is what it's called? Yeah, it's called the Tetris. Okay. It's like Tetris company and then, oh gosh. But I are, they, are they owned by a larger conglomerate? I don't, I don't want to... Uh, there's it's like blue ocean blue something or other uh so basically the story with tetris is that you know when alexei pajnetnov made it in russia a bunch of people pretended they had the license for it whatever like that there's this whole story about it and people would make illegal copies and eventually it was a lawyer named hank rogers who worked for nintendo who finally got went over there and had a legit contract and was like we're gonna do this stuff for the game boy version and all this stuff and eventually you know they were the ones that brought it to the game boy hank rogers was technically the ceo of the tetris company he became the 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 ceo but now the ceo is his daughter maya rogers so she basically runs it and um they're the ones that determine everything like i don't even know if you noticed but like all the tetris games now the pieces are always the same color 
right so you know like uh like the the t piece is always going to be purple in every game like they oh determine god yeah i guess that's right okay yeah so they get to determine a lot of these like rules and stuff so they kind of own tetris do they have any display. aspirations to to promote more competitions uh the thing is i don't think they really realized like its potential but yeah. i think they're with the way that this has gone viral so viral in the last couple of years when joseph beat jonas when the 16 year old beat the seven time champion yeah. you know that video was up to like 10 million views on youtube yeah. you know i mean honestly i think more people have watched me commentating tetris than fighting games <laughs> at this point in time well, it's, you it's, know? it's so funny because I, I i'm sure you've had the same experience there's people that just don't get this job yeah you know uh, and you uh -huh. try to explain like well how could you sit there and Right, uh, talk and pontificate uh -huh. while these other guys, and I, you know, a lot of times I say, well, you do, there's so much happening here. Mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. just the stories, but there's 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 strategies they're doing, yeah. there's stuff to unpack, and I'm trying to translate the game. But um, a lot of the people that never got, I mean, most of them are back in Kansas, you know, where, I'm, where I'm from. <laughs> but I, I sent that video uh -huh, to tons uh -huh. of people, and people, and, and they were into it for the first yeah, time ever. Uh -huh, people said, uh -huh. "Oh my God, I get it." Okay, yeah. you know. It showed up on, like, they played it. It's funny. So last year's championship, the one that Joseph won first time, ended up on uh, ESPN2 during the Ocho block. You oh, know, really? the, yeah. So you know, so ESPN two has the Ocho, right? Which right. is the joke thing where they have like lawnmower racing and all Hot these crazy things. And, yeah. yeah. But the the Tetris block apparently got so popular that this last year. They just played it straight up on ESPN too, as just wow. a, a, an hour. It went from a half hour block on the Ocho to an hour block on ESPN two. And the interesting thing about it is, uh, l the guys who run the the classic Tetris social media, like they just do a search for while while it's on TV, and there's just like tweets all over the place. They're like. I'm watching Tetris and it's the most amazing thing yeah. ever. You know, they're like, I can't believe I'm, I thought this would be terrible, but this is the most compelling yeah. thing I've yeah. ever, yeah. <laughs> so Tetris just has that ability and it's, you know, and like I said, like, like, like we were saying, like, I just feel like it's like the perfect video game for that reason. Yeah. You know, you don't have to explain it to anybody and they can already just like watch someone amazing at it. And you're like, I don't know how, how they're doing this. What, what is it like to, to go from game to game? Because uh, as a commentator, oh, excuse yeah, me. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, because different games have a different tempo to yeah. them. Um, <laughs> is is there one that you feel the most comfortable in, or the safest as a commentator? Uh, I mean, that would still be Street Fighter, probably, just because I've done it the most. Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, for the most part, a lot of the fighting games, it's it's really about kind of knowing the system and the storylines of all the players and everything like that. So sometimes, like, uh, if I jump into a game that I'm not as familiar with, the hardest part, honestly, is that I don't know the backstories of a lot of the yeah. players, and I want to be able to talk about, you know, stuff that they do and everything. Um, in terms of just the actual game mechanics... Um, yeah, I mean, fighting games and Tetris are very, very different from each other. Yeah. But even within fighting games, it's very different because, you know, um, like Street Fighter, for example, is a little bit slower paced fighting game. So I can kind of talk about situations a little more than like when I used to commentate like Ultimate Marvel versus Capcom 3. That game is so fast. You just don't have time to like. Say. Yeah, there's like things you almost have to pass over. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. you're just basically going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my god, <laughs> you know, the whole time. And then I'll commentate something like Samurai Showdown, which is a very slow place game, yeah. but it's a very dangerous game. You can lose 80% of your life in one mistake. And so, like, you, the way I commentate that game is I try to be very tense and, like, Ooh, you know, very, yeah, like, yeah. ass clenched kind of, you know, yeah, like, yeah. oh, my God, kind of thing. So, you know, it's even within fighting games, like, I try to use different mentalities for the different games, you know. But, uh, again, for me, in the end, it's mostly just about, you know, the story and the player decision making and stuff. Because, like I said, I, I always want the players to be the ones that shine, you know, out of everything, so... Being, um, even though I think neither of us are old, we're both elders in a way in, in, our, in our scenes. Um, I mean, is, is it ever, uh, is it ever weird? Like, do you ever feel like imposter syndrome being kind of like a, a leader in this scene? Or is it ever weird to, to do public speaking? I, I, I suffer from so much massive imposter syndrome. I've, I've had this too. Yeah. yeah. I, I never think that like, I, like, 
on my I, I stream myself you know and like yeah. you know I've started just kind of streaming myself talking more right yeah. instead of like playing games and people like to hear me talk and I'm always like why are people listening to me? yeah, yeah. No, I've, I've had this really, uh, <laughs> like I, I, it took me uh, about three years in Korea to, to finally get GSL you know, I had to uh -huh, wait for like, Starcraft uh -huh. 2 to come out and then I remember like I started casting and I was looking around and I thought why are they letting me do this yeah you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah this no, is so strange uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's still weird to me. Cause, I mean, honestly, I mean, I told this story. I had this conversation with Mike Ross a long time ago, uh, you know, when we were wondering whether it was worth it to kind of try to go all in on yeah. to this kind of thing. And, you know, one of the stories I always like to talk about, I'm a big basketball fan. Unfortunately, I don't watch much anymore because I'm so busy all the time. It's hard for me to keep up with seasons anymore. But, you know, the original basketball, the first superstar is this player named George Mikan. Uh, believe he passed away like practically bankrupt right you know because that's just the thing it's like when it's brand new nobody really gets the success out of it yeah. and so that's kind of what I was talking about with Mike Ross I was like the people who establish this kind of things are kind of like the the martyrs in a weird yeah. way like you do it because you love it because of the passion you don't get to reap the benefits you don't get honestly if by the time we hit like Mandalay Bay, like Evo was, like Evo is right now, right. like I thought I'd be long dead. You know? <laughs> <laughs> like I really honestly didn't think it would have grown as fast as it even has. Yeah. And you know, the FGC is still small in comparison to a lot of the other games. And uh, even still, like I, like if you told me, you know, back in 2009 or even in 2008, especially in 2008, because that was before Street Fighter 4 hit. If you told me that this is the situation, like, like, oh, yeah, in over 10 years, you know, you're going to be flown out to Japan to do commentary for fighting games. Yeah. I would have just laughed at you. I was like, there's no way we'll get there. Yeah. And, and, and we're here. And so. And I think it's going to keep getting bigger. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. But to, 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 to answer the question directly, it's very weird. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, people will come up to me and be like, oh, can I get, you know, a picture with you or autograph? And, you know, and it's like, but I'm just this dude who likes watching fighting games, yeah. you know, and talking <laughs> about it and stuff. And so it's, it is, it's a very weird thing. But, you know, in the end, as long as I can get more people to watch it, and appreciate fighting games, then, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep trying to do it as much as I can. But I mean, I don't know how much longer I can. <laughs> how is it um, doing commentary and then also streaming? Because everybody I've talked to uh -huh. says it, it's like this weird balancing act that the moment that you leave, your subs go. Yeah. And, and you know, it's it's streaming is all about consistency, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. this line of work commentary, you basically kind of, can't stream yeah, uh, and you, can, you yeah, can't yeah. have any consistency. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a tough situation. So I'm trying to build up my streaming uh, audience because I mean, honestly, again, you know, the fighting game community doesn't have like the kind of financial backing that Riot can put into League or or you know that. Uh, that you know a lot of the other games can get and so what ends up happening is like i need to build up my stream just to kind of like as a side revenue kind of thing you know as a as an extra kind of revenue and you know the past three years you're right like the traveling and everything like that and my own you know uh you know mental you know laziness you know procrastination whatever like i've not been consistent with the stream and everything like that so i've never been able to build up the audience i'm, I'm trying really hard this year to yeah. try to do more more of a kind of thing and and actually try to go more like your brother like try to do more educational kind of stuff yeah. like that you know kind of corner that niche because he was really a great teacher i feel like i'm i'm kind of in that kind of mentality I, I, as well yeah, he, i think what he did was really smart is getting in and just especially for beginners showing them yeah. okay here's how you play <laughs> mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. we'll take the early stuff you know the the, the day nine dailies and all yeah. that here's how to play starcraft um yeah, because it's 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 hard to balance yeah. streaming. I mean, con like this is obviously it's not live, so I can kind of put it out when 
it's ready. <laughs> but live streaming is tricky. So, you, so you're yeah. thinking about doing more like educational shows? Yeah, so I, I used to do that. Streams. I used to do that a lot uh, oh. when I first started streaming, like like eight years ago or something like that. When when me and David first started doing like our Tuesday show kind of thing, yeah. you know, um, you know, I have this show called First Attack, you know, and it was about like learning fighting games and stuff. And I just moved away from it because you know it did take prep work. You know, I wanted to make sure I had all my bullet points and everything, and right. I got lazy and I didn't do it a lot. Last year, I said, I'm bringing it back, and I never did because, <laughs> like I said, it's just that's how my brain is. And But this year, uh, like on the plane ride here to Japan, I just had my iPad out and I'm just like outlining everything. I'm trying to like schedule and scope out all the stuff that I want to do and everything because, you know, I just – I streaming really is about kind of like consistency kind of thing, yeah. you know what I mean? And 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 – Right now, like I said, uh, I, I keep, you know, I hate trying to sound all doom and gloom and whatever like that. But like financially, this hasn't been the most uh, uh, lucrative thing yeah, <laughs> for yeah. me. Uh, I've basically been in the red for like the whole time I've been doing this. Oh, right. Wow, and okay. so, uh, you know, I need to, to get something to work a little bit better and stuff. So fortunately, I mean, my my previous job, I was a programmer. Uh, I, I made a lot of money back then, so I had a decent amount of savings. Recently, I just had to do a bunch of home repairs, so I kind of lost oh, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> you know how that is, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's the, the, more, the more stuff you get, the more yeah. expensive it becomes. And <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, you know uh, I, I, obviously I would like to try to keep doing this as long as I can, yeah. but, you know, there's financial realities and stuff like that yeah. so you know if i could make the streaming stuff work this year that would be really cool is, is it is it hard negotiating like from event to event because for me personally I, I found that to be very stressful it's like <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm not on the road uh as, especially last year i wasn't on the road that much i might right. be traveling more um this year but yeah like trying to talk to a company and convince them to give you money yeah. or, or whatever you know it's, the accommodations are and then because the one of the hardest things about it is is because uh you know for something like the capcom pro tour it's mm -hmm. capcom funded and so you can be like oh you know you know hopefully i like this is how much i hope to get paid or whatever like that right but then like i, I mentioned <laughs> i was at frosty faustings right like this yeah. is literally run by just like these guys right they're not a corporate they're, yeah they're not sitting on yeah, a pile uh -huh. of money that they're trying to keep from you so. exactly right so you know so they're like hey we can only pay you this much right like even the, the tetris stuff that i've done they're still super grassroots right? right so they they're not you know they they don't they're not sitting there rolling in cash kind of thing yeah. as well and so you know like it's weird because on some places you're like i want this much and then on other places yeah yeah i'll take like you know one yeah, sixth yeah. of that one tenth of that you know kind of thing yeah, and so there's this weird thing in esports now because it it is big yeah um, but in a lot of cases the money's not there yet yeah. or if the money is there it's then entirely from the publisher yeah or 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 you know it's like a lot of things it's like the one percent right yeah. you know the money kind of just certain a, a small subset of the yeah, people I've thought see kind of like broadway almost you know like there's oh, yeah. all these people in in new york that are aspiring to be actors yeah, but yeah, only yeah, a okay. few people uh -huh. are making right a, a, yeah, yeah, a killing, yeah. uh -huh, you know and then uh -huh. a lot of people are just starving artists <laughs> and i think esports is very similar as yeah. well yeah and, and it's a weird situation, too, because, I mean, people know me, you know, as like one of the premier Street Fighter, you know, commentators. And but it's still, you know, obviously, like I said, it's I mean, it doesn't. Uh, let's put it this way. If I didn't live in Southern California. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe I would be OK right now. But I mean, obviously, the cost of living. I mean, I'm not in northern california i mean at least oh it's insane that's, yeah. that's where my brother's at and oh yeah he's oh my god <laughs> i mean I, I i don't want to say how much his apartment costs but when i was there, i was like wait how much yeah. are you paying for this this is uh-huh it's, it's so expensive yeah. but the hardest thing is like there's also a lot of opportunities in los angeles you yeah know, like the esl studios are there you know b before it closed down machinima was there you know like er yeah. there's a lot of things this is why i'm in seoul is there's always starcraft stuff yeah. in seoul mm -hmm. and all i have to do is get on the train and go yep <laughs> there's no there's no like what about hotels or right. um at know. least you have a train you can get on I yeah stuck in traffic in southern <laughs> california oh gosh how, how is this uh how's this podcast been i think uh we're gonna wrap it up here because it's six now you're casting at seven right yeah yeah, yeah. uh-huh mm -hmm. okay good well let's uh we were gonna do a quick after show but how, how was this was this 
Oh, I really yeah. appreciate you doing uh, this. No, yeah, this is fine. I mean, this is really cool. Like I said, I'm I'm absolutely honored to be here. And like, well, thanks, man. I, I was telling I was telling you the story before we started this that you know like when me and David first started commentating, you know, people were calling us the taste toasters of the fighting game community. Dude, Dan and, you know, been a fan of you guys. Yeah, for a which while. is which is blowing my mind. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, because there like, weren't that many people doing this, especially in the past. So right. whenever we'd see somebody else doing, we're like, uh, hey, what's going on over here? We'd yeah, be like, oh, <laughs> fighting game cash is pretty good. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know for me like you know i feel like you guys are up there and i we're still like down here like you oh, know no way man no, I, <laughs> no I, I love i love how authentic casting is mm -hmm, in, mm -hmm. in fgc i mean yeah. i'm not trying to knock on other game casters right, in other yeah, games, yeah. but I, I like the authenticity and how yeah. passionate people are it's funny too because i you, i don't know if you remember but like when me and david first started doing this more seriously we started wearing more shirts with ties and stuff yeah. like that and I've just stopped that because like, yeah. you know, like, uh, like two of our comments, like Yipes and Logan, Tasty Steve, like yeah. these guys will never wear a tie, you right. know? And, and then the thing about it, I was like, that's fine. Cause that's the fighting game community. You know what I mean? Yeah, and there's so, been like, a lot of debate about, are we supposed to be in ties or yeah. not? Because, I mean, you know, in, in, in Korea, they just, people wear suits on TV. Right. So it's, I'm like, okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's fine. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what we're supposed to be. I don't. Because yeah. sometimes you see these guys and they're so young and they're like in a suit and they look like they're going to mom prom or something. And it's just, it's weird. But then there's yeah. also people, some people can't dress themselves, you mm -hmm, know, mm -hmm. even if it, even if it's not in a suit. Where, I mean, true story, yeah. I've never learned how to tie a tie until Me that too. period. <laughs> Me too. No, I still don't know how to tie a tie. Oh, yeah. This day, okay. yeah. I always try to get somebody else to do it. I refuse you to grow up in that regard. Oh, um, all right. Well, thank you for doing this. We'll go to yeah. the after show now. Guys, thank you for listening to that episode and from here on out everything is going to be um modern and and obviously much more topical so uh, i do look forward to continuing to release this podcast i feel like i've been getting better and better with each interview and it's cool to do something new um something a little bit different from casting uh, or streaming uh, again check my uh, twitch channel out uh, tasteless tv on twitch i'm usually streaming every Monday and Thursday afternoon. Uh, I'm gonna try to build a, a larger schedule, but for now I'm still pretty busy with all this other stuff. Anyways guys, thanks for watching. I love you, bye-bye. Special thanks to our top supporters on Patreon, Seth N, Rohit Somebody, John Kernicki, and Charlie Sheever.